Hey there, and welcome to You Talk. We highlight stories from across Canada, the diverse cultures and communities living here, and individuals and organizations that make life the best, that help make life the best it can be. I'm your host, Ryan Funk. Camping, hiking, and nature exploration continue as people enjoy the latter half of summer before the Canadian fall kicks in and the dreaded winter follows. Spending as much outdoor time as possible, people may not be thinking about ticks as the height of summer has passed. However, according to Associate Professor of Veterinary Entomology at the University of Manitoba, Dr. Catherine Rochon, it's essential to keep close attention until there is snow on the ground. Dr. Catherine walks us through the various ticks we can find here in Canada, how to identify them, and the best practices to protect yourself from tick-borne diseases. So my name is Catherine Rochon. I'm an associate professor of uh, veterinary entomology at the University of Manitoba. Now, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> so entomology is a specialty of biology, I guess, um, where I'm I study insects and other arthropods. So not everything that is creepy crawly is an insect. Um, insects have six legs. And so within those, I'd be studying mostly like biting flies and things like that, uh, because I'm interested in the insects and other arthropods that affect animal health, mm -hmm. hence the veterinary part of my title. Um, but I also study ticks and ticks are arthropods. Uh, so they're not insects. They have eight legs instead of six. Mm -hmm. They're more closely related to spiders. And the interest there is that they suck blood too. Yeah. Oh, that's so crazy. Like you wouldn't think that they're closely related to like spiders or like scorpions. They don't look anything alike. No. And actually they're, um, I guess if you wanted to be more specific, they're related to mites. So ticks mm -hmm. are like to a point, like really big mites, <laughs> um, <laughs> but they are closer uh, to, to spiders in that way than, than they are to, to insects. And so, um, and then my background, um, well, I have a, a PhD in entomology and before that, uh, most of my studies were biological sciences. And then I, during my undergrad, I took a course in entomology because it fit my schedule. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't particularly interested in insects. I was actually mostly afraid of them. Mm -hmm. And I took this course because the alternative was to take the fish course. And I really wasn't interested in fish. So I took <laughs> the bug course and it changed my life. Yeah. So just kind of That's weighing both here. options. You're like fish, fish, bugs. bugs yeah. <laughs> I think bugs are going to be better. And I just sat there and entomology just blew my mind. And I just thought, wow, this is a fascinating world. Um, and then I was interested in animals and, and uh, just, you know, wildlife and, and, you know, little girl who wanted to be a vet kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, realizing the impact that um, insects and other arthropods can have on animals, uh, on their health and everything um, was really fascinating to me. And that's, that's kind of where I went. So that's why there's that, that mixture of uh, animal health, uh, mostly working with livestock here and, um, mm -hmm. and all the, the stuff that can make them sick or uncomfortable. You mentioned you were a little bit of, uh, scared of insects beforehand. How'd you get out? push how'd you get pushed through that kind of like fear and that kind of like uh, shiver that you feel up your body once you see them walking around well I mean I'd like to point out that you know if I'm working on something and all of a sudden there's you know an insect or a spider that comes running by I will like <laughs> jump and scream like every normal person um but you know I was just I was afraid and I realized it was really because it was the unknown um, and I didn't know, like when I would see something, you know, coming to me or crawling or anything like that, I didn't know if it was dangerous or not. I didn't mm -hmm. know if it would bite me or sting me or if it was friendly or not. And I just, I was just afraid uh, because I didn't know. And, and I guess, you know, growing up, uh, there was this association between, you know, insects and bites or stings or things like that, or, oh, don't touch that. It's dirty. Mm -hmm. And with this, you know, with the course, I got to learn, well, which ones are likely to bite or sting. And, you know, that's really a small proportion. 
And it was just so interesting. Everything else that um, my fear turned into just fascination. And the more mm. you learn about them, of course, then the less scared you are because you understand them. And, and all I see now is just the fascinating parts. Um, and then knowing which ones not to handle or handle carefully. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Um, so not all ticks uh, are created equal. What kind of ticks are kind of here in Manitoba and kind of just Canada's broad, but mostly here in Manitoba? And which ones do we need to be watching out for more regularly? Yeah, so ticks are uh, little small eight-legged critters, um, and we can find them, uh, some uh, species, uh, relatively easily in Manitoba. So there are lots of, of tick species uh, in Canada and in Manitoba in particular, <laughs> but many of those ticks are very host specific. So you're not, you know, there's a grouse tick, but you're very, you're not likely to encounter that tick unless you find a grouse. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so as far as we are concerned as humans, um, you know, makers of children's and owners of pets, um, we are concerned mostly about two species. One is locally known as the wood tick, uh, the proper common name, if you were to go on the internet and search for information on it, would be the American dog tick. Uh, but here in Manitoba, when people talk about those, they talk about wood ticks. And we also have the black-legged tick. And that is also sometimes referred to as a deer tick. So deer tick and black-legged tick, same thing. Just the proper common name is black-legged tick. Those two species you can find here in Manitoba and will bite humans and will bite our pets as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so when you're walking around, you hear a lot of stories from people about where they get ticks, like, oh, they drop from the, tr uh, the trees, they're, they're flying around watching out for us. Um, where do you actually pick up ticks? Yes, ticks do not jump and ticks do not fly. We are grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so ticks are actually at ground level most of the time. They um, they will climb. They have a, a be those two species. Not all like you said. Not all ticks are equal. But what I will say will be generalized for the two species I talked mm -hmm. about. So the ones we find here, the American dog tick and the black legged tick. And so the those two have a certain behavior called questing. When they're looking for a host, they're looking for something they're going to attach to uh, to feed on blood, they quest. And so what that is, is that they'll climb up at the tip of blades of grass or very low shrubs. And then they will hang on with six, four to six of their legs. And they'll have their front pair of legs out in the air like this. And then they'll be sort of waving um, <clears throat> and they'll wait. And so when you, where do you acquire ticks? Well, when you're walking down a trail and you brush against those little pieces of, of grass that are either in the middle or just along the sides, then the tick is there with its little legs um, ready to go. And as you brush by, it just sort of attaches. And yeah, that's just a little, a little hitchhiker. A little hitchhiker. And of course you don't notice this, um, because you're enjoying the scenery and you're not constantly looking down. Um, but they don't jump and they, uh, they don't jump from uh, or, or, or fall from oak trees or, or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, they are really at the ground level. Um, and when you find them on your head, it's because they've climbed all the way up while you were not paying attention. Mm -hmm. So can we find those in like, if you just go to your local park or like even in your backyard if you have one of those. Can you pick up ticks there? Yes. Um, it's not uh, the best place in the sense that, <laughs> um, you know, if you go out to uh, a park where there's really a trail or even within the city, if, you know, there's green areas where there's more vegetation, then obviously you're, you're much more likely to get ticks there. But if you have a nice backyard um, that has some grass and uh, some vegetation, uh, maybe some trees that will uh, provide a little bit of shade, uh, you can definitely find ticks uh, in the city, uh, in your backyard in Winnipeg. Uh, some years ago, I was renting a, a house in, um, 
in Norwood Flats. Mm-hmm. And I came back from work. Um, I was actually spending most of my day that day looking for ticks elsewhere. So, um, I mean, all my, you know, my field gear and I, we didn't find any ticks that day. And I get home and I put my, my hand to go to get my door, get the doorknob to my back yep. door. And there was a tick right there. <laughs> uh, of course, it just shows up right at the last minute. <laughs> yeah. So you can definitely find them uh, in the parks. Uh, so, you know, I know we'll probably talk about uh, safety and protection uh, a bit mm-hmm. later on, but I would say, you know, if you go outside um, anywhere where there's a little bit of vegetation, uh, you need to you need to check yourself. You can't expect ticks to only be in wild places. Yeah, that's kind of the thing when it comes to wildlife. It never never just stays uh, where we we think they're going to be. That's right. <laughs> Perfect. So, ticks can show up basically anywhere out uh, in your yards where there's vegetation close to the ground. They climb on you, they bite you looking for food. Why is it so dangerous to get bitten by ticks? Well, getting a tick bite in itself, um, if it's just the tick biting you, isn't very dangerous in the same sense that getting a mosquito bite from just a mosquito bite by mm-hmm. itself is not that dangerous. However, if that tick is carrying a certain pathogen, so bacteria or virus, then while it feeds, it can transfer it and then mm-hmm. transmit it to you and then you become sick. So in the same way that a mosquito by itself is not dangerous unless the mosquito is a carrier for malaria, for example, and then transmits malaria to you from the bite, then that's why a mosquito okay. is considered, you know, the most dangerous animal on earth because through their transmission ability, they kill a lot of people. And so ticks are the same way. Um, they are well known for carrying uh, pathogens. So usually bacteria or viruses, um, and mm-hmm. then they can transmit them to you. So here in Manitoba, we have, uh, as far as tick-borne diseases, so all those, uh, diseases that you can get from the pathogen transmitted by a tick. Um, The ones in Manitoba would be Lyme disease, Mm -hmm. um, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and Powassan fever virus. Those four can be transmitted by black-legged ticks, uh, not by American dog ticks. And so, uh, so that's why everybody's very concerned about ticks because mm-hmm. the tick itself is just really annoying. It's yeah. taking your blood and you don't want that. Um, nobody wants parasites, right? Um, but there's the added level of concern because of the pathogens they can transmit. Mm-hmm. Why is it that black-legged ticks carry these much more dangerous diseases? Is it because of the things that they're eating before they get to us? Um, well, there's two levels there. Um, technically, your American dog tick can have all those pathogens I talked about. Okay. However, they are unable to transmit them. And Mm. so that makes them a lot less dangerous. So if I was to just take an American dog tick and crush it and test it for pathogens, they might be positive. Okay. But while feeding, that tick can't transmit it to you. It just, it keeps it to him, to itself. Oh, very interesting. Black-legged ticks. Well, yeah, it, it is. It, it, it really makes a difference, you know, which tick has what. Um, and it, but it's the same thing for other um, for other vectors. Same thing for malaria. Some mosquitoes mm-hmm. can transmit malaria and some mosquitoes can't like they could have the pathogen in their in their gut and it and, and then it transfers to their body and it goes to their salivary glands. It just can't come out or it can't multiply inside the mosquito. Uh, And so in some cases for ticks, it'll be, you know, they acquire the same bacteria, they feed on the same little mouse, and they Mm -hmm. get Lyme disease from that same mouse, but one can transmit it and the other can't. So that's that's why black legged ticks are a little bit more, you know, concerning. It is, it's fascinating. (laughs) Mind blown right there. Um, So yeah, these black legged ticks, they can transfer these paths pathogens to us so what time of the year should be watching out for the just ticks in general i know a lot of people talk about tick season um 
and they usually mention like during summer, like uh, July, August, like, oh, I got ticks everywhere. Counted like 12 of them. Everyone's like comparing the number of ticks they found. Is there such thing as a tick season? Um, there is. And I guess I would maybe define that as uh, times of the year where ticks are more active. And so you are more likely to encounter them. So in Manitoba, to simplify things, I usually say if there's no snow on the ground, it's tick season because ticks will come out in the spring um, as soon as the snow melts and you get some warmer, sunny days. But by warmer, mm -hmm. I mean, it could be 10 degrees. If it's nice and sunny, um, ticks will start to come out. Uh, they, they don't die over winter. They, they spend the winter well hidden. And as soon as winter is over, they'll come out and they'll be looking for a host. So um, in the spring, they'll come out. Usually black-legged ticks will come out. Uh, the ones that will, the adults that will overwinter will come out uh, fairly yeah. early on uh, in April if there is no snow. And then a little bit later, uh, May and and June, you'll get your adult American dog ticks that will uh, come out. Um, and those will last until uh, into July. You can still find, um, find quite a few. Yeah. Now, June in particular, and a little bit of July, but June in particular is tricky because you will then get the nymphs of the black-legged ticks. Now, the, we didn't go over the life cycle of a tick, but let's just say, I'll try to make it short. Out of a tick egg, tiny little wee tick egg will come out a larva and that larva will find something to feed on, um, something small like a mouse will engorge, fall to the ground, molt into a nymph. Mm -hmm. That nymph will look for a host, attach, feed on blood, engorge, fall to the ground, and then molt into an adult. So there's mm -hmm. three life stages. They all feed only on blood. The nymphs of the black-legged ticks can transmit all those pathogens I talked about, um, but they are very, very small. They're about the size of a poppy seed. Mm. Um, in fact, the CDC had a tweet some years ago that grossed out many people, but they took they took black-legged tick nymphs and they put them on top of a, of a poppy seed uh. muffin. <laughs> so that you can compare. And, and when you just look at it, you don't see the nymphs because they look exactly like poppy seeds. And of course, people complained because now they couldn't eat muffins. I mean, it's a great um, way to get the message across. The message was crystal clear. And I use that image all the time. So they really are the size of poppy seeds, which can be very difficult to detect. Um, and so and sometimes they're a little bit off the radar in the sense that you don't see maybe as many, uh, you don't see as many black-legged ticks um, in June. Mm -hmm. You do get a lot of American dog ticks, but they're much bigger. Um, mm -hmm. And so those are easy to detect, but you don't necessarily think of looking for the super tiny things. So that would say, I would say in June, that's, that's a, a tricky time and you need to really be careful. Um, and then, most people in Manitoba will say, yeah, but then when you get to like end of July and August, there are no more ticks. <laughs> True, there's lower activity, but black-legged ticks, adults come back in the fall. So those nymphs that were active there in, in June, they fed, molted, and then the adults are coming out. Um, mm -hmm. And they will be active in uh, late September, October, through when there's going to be snow on the ground. And a lot of people here in Manitoba are not used to that. Black-legged ticks haven't been around for a long time here in the province. Mm -hmm. And people are very surprised that there's tick activity in the fall. Uh, so you, if there's no snow on the ground, you should check for ticks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like come, come fall, everyone's kind of just going out those last little remnants of camping season, getting ready. And yeah, you're rolling around in leaves, going for hikes. And yeah, you know, you never uh, notice these small little uh, little buggers mm -hmm. <laughs> getting on you. Yeah. And people who go hunting need to be mindful of that as well, because all the stories I hear of hunting, you're out out in the bush for days without washing. Well, you know, you mm -hmm. should consider tick trekking still. <laughs> <laughs> so 
I yeah, talking about checking for ticks. Um, you know, how can we find ticks? You know, how can I find them on myself, a family member, or specifically a, a pet? You're talking about these these tiny tiny nymphs. If you've got like uh, a husky or some other, um, uh, you know, two coated dog with just a lot of fur, there. Uh, how are you supposed to find them? And how how do you go about removing him? Because you know, I hear stories all the time, like, oh yeah, you just put some vaseline or some more extreme things are like ah, gasoline you just <laughs> burn it off <laughs> how are you supposed to get them uh, off yeah okay so um we'll start we'll start at the beginning of your question so first of all on us right so mm-hmm. um you're going outside and this applies of course for your for you know children as well children don't tend to notice when things are <laughs> feeding on them or attached you know when they gather friends so you have to um when you're coming back from your hike or from going to the park or something like that, um, take your clothes off, get naked and check yourself um, mm-hmm. and check um, check your children. That could also be at the end of the day. But personally, I would say as soon as you get home, if you know you've been in an area where there might be ticks, just check. Uh, check yourself. Ideally, you would also uh, have a quick shower because uh, especially when it's nymph time, uh, you, uh, it's well demonstrated that just, you know, a shower with regular scrubbing, you don't have to, you know, scratch the outer layer of your skin there. You can just regular with regular washing. Um, that's enough to remove, uh, some nymphs that you may have uh, missed, but just, you get naked. Um, there are certain areas where you're more likely to find ticks on your body. Um, and I often describe that a little bit like a, like an old time, uh, wrestler outfit, you know, sort yeah. of a leotard type thing. And so you'll have around your scalp, um, and the back of your neck, and then you'll have the armpits, the sides yeah. of the body, and then the groin area. Um, you have to consider that ticks like where there's going to be a little bit of pressure, Um, And so uh, around your waist where you would have uh, your pants with maybe a belt or even just Mm -hmm. the elastic from underwear, those are all places where they they would like to be. Also areas that are a bit warmer. So that's why you have the armpit and then the groin area. There's a lot of activity. If you're walking, things heat Mm up. Uh, Then behind your knees as well is another uh, preferred area. But you have to just look, you look all over. Um, I'm going to go right away to how to remove the tick and then I'll come back to pets. Okay. You want to remove it as, um, as quickly as possible. The best way would be if you have uh, fine nose uh, or fine tip tweezers and you would go and you go as close to your skin as possible. And you would um, then use the tweezers to pull the tick uh, straight up. So you don't want to twist it. You don't want to do jerk it really quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, you just want to grab it as close to the skin as possible and then slowly pull up. The reason for this is that you want, the reason you go as close to the skin as possible is that you don't want to push on the body. If the tick has been feeding for a little bit of time, mm-hmm. the body will be engorged and that's like a balloon. And if you push on the balloon, you're going to be squeezing a lot of juice into yeah, yourself. everything and right back in. Yeah. Everything right back in. And if the tick is infected with something, that something will be in its saliva. And so by squeezing the body, um, you know, there's a, a greater risk of, of more pathogens going into you. So you don't want to squeeze the tick. You So you go as close to the skin as possible, and then you pull up. When you have, um, you know, grandma's tricks like using a match or using Vaseline or, you know, kerosene or heaven forbid both of those together. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Those are not good for a variety of reasons. Vaseline, uh, if the idea is to, um, you know, keep the the tick from breathing, well, sure, at some point the tick won't like being coated in Vaseline, but all this time it's still feeding. So that's what you want to cut is the feeding because that's where the pathogens are transmission. And then if you've coated your tick in Vaseline, it gets really slippery and more difficult to remove. It's going to be more hard. It's going to be way more difficult. Yeah, you're right. So don't do that. Um, And then um, anything that, I mean, I know a lot of people want to hurt ticks. That's, that's fine, but you can do that after it's off your body. So, you know, if you burn it or if you poke it with a needle or things like that, you're going to, 
create pain. They do feel, you know, they, they don't, they, it's uncomfortable and then they'll salivate more. Any mm-hmm. kind of extra stress will just cause more uh, salivation. So you just, you want to remove it as quickly as possible. You want to stop that feeding and the most efficient way is to, uh, to pull it off. And if you don't have tweezers, use your fingers. Um, just try to go as close to the skin as possible. And the idea is to pull straight up. Mm-hmm. There's concerns often as uh, about the, the head. Well, the, the head's going to stay in. And then I've heard people say, and then it travels to your brain. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the head, uh, what we refer to as the head, is really just the mouth. It's just the mouth part. Mm-hmm. Um, and in black legged ticks, the, the mouth parts are very thin um, and fairly long. And if they do break when you pull on the tick, um, then you, it's, it's really would be just like a sliver. And so you would just remove, you know, look for it and, and yeah, yeah, pull yeah. on it and remove. Um, but it's actually, the mouth parts really are quite small. Um, and they don't typically like they wouldn't stay embedded. And after you remove a tick, any tick, you still want to disinfect the area. Mm -hmm. And then of course, if you, if you do have a little piece of tick left, um, then, you know, there, there's going to be some, some, some redness and swelling, and then you can get that taken care of. Um, so I can go over pets now. Yeah. Pets would be great. Pets would be great. Yeah. So Again, not all pets are as susceptible to ticks in in a way. Um, Mm. So just like, you know, some people tend to have more ticks or more mosquito bites, certain pets are are more attractive to ticks uh, than others. Uh, Sometimes just just the the coat, right? The the type of fur they have Mm -hmm. uh, is going to be more or less conducive to picking up the ticks. Um, Cats, for example, don't tend to have a lot of ticks, mostly because they're very good at grooming. Um, mm-hmm. with the little, their little, um, yeah, the little bar tongue, tongue, yeah, actually is very good at, at removing ticks. And where you'll find ticks on a cat, very often there'll be nymphs, so the very small ones, um, on the face where they can't use their tongue very effectively. Yeah. Um, for dogs, uh, again, if they have double coats, uh, sometimes it's difficult for ticks to get through to the oh, skin. So, so that can help. That can help. That 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 can help. Um, and again, what I would say, it, you you have to. When we look for ticks on animals, um, I just spent you know time with my students. We're uh, looking for ticks on on cattle, actually. So, mm-hmm. um, and what I tell them is, you're going to feel a tick first. Before you see it, you're going to feel it. So give your pets a lot of love, a lot of nice scratching and a lot of of touching um, and especially um, around the head, uh, the neck, uh, between the shoulders and then uh, the legs. So the, you know, the uh, Mm -hmm. let's say the armpit, we're going to call it right. (laughs) But the the inner leg parts um, and then between the toes, those are places where uh, ticks like to like to go. Anywhere where there's going to be uh, maybe lighter hair coat, uh, where skin is more accessible, um, sometimes also the ears uh, yeah. will be will be areas where where ticks will like to be. Um, you have to also keep in mind. So how do the ticks get on their host? Right. So I talked about that. It's when they're when when you're the the host is walking around and, and mm-hmm. contacting shrubbery, and so that's why the legs. Uh, you know, under the, where there's the joints, the shoulder, that's kind of where the ticks would be. Cause I know for my dog, uh, she's really small. So when she does walk, yeah, it's usually along her like back and then on her ears. Cause you know, yeah. that's where the grass and brush is kind of touching her. Exactly. Perfect. Um, yeah. We've gone over, you know, how to, you know, remove a tick. How do we prevent ticks getting on us in the first place? Or how do we reduce the the risk of getting them to bite well that's the key isn't it it's like everything else prevention Mm -hmm. so you want to reduce the chances that you'll have to pull that tick off of you um and so there are quite a number of things actually we can do and many for many many of them it's just the key is to get those things to become a habit in our lives Mm -hmm. so when you're going out uh you're going to 
going for a hike or just at the park to walk with the dog. I know that when it's, you know, 38 degrees, if I tell you, you need long pants and socks and closed shoes, you're going to look at me and say, are you crazy woman? (laughs) But (laughs) earlier in tick season um, and in, we're going to call them normal years, hopefully the crazy weather doesn't Mm -hmm. become normal. um, You would want what you have to think the goal is to reduce the ticks access to skin. Mm-hmm. If it gets skin, it gets what it wants. So ticks are low to the ground. So if you have closed shoes or boots, then they don't get access through that. Then you have your long pants and you do the amazingly hot fashion trend of putting your pants into your socks. Mm-hmm. And that way, the tick that gets on your shoe uh, will climb up. Ticks will climb up no matter what. And so they'll go on your socks and then they'll go on top of your pants, not on your socks and under your pants where they get access to skin and you can't see them. So you tuck your pants into your socks, you tuck your shirt into your pants for the same reason. So that when the tick gets to your, to your waistband, um, it goes on, it stays on the surface of your clothes, not under where there's skin. Yeah. So it gives you that much more time to notice a tick or go from your, your walk or hike, get back home. You, you take it off, you check, you're like, okay, they were all over my clothes. And exactly. You throw them in the dryer. You do, you do. You throw them in the dryer on hot and that will kill uh, the ticks that you haven't seen. Um, another thing is of course, because your goal is to keep those ticks on top of your clothes, if you wear lighter colored clothing, there will be contrast and you can see those ticks climbing um, easy, easily. Mm-hmm. And so you can give them a little flick there yeah, so that um, they don't actually attach and they don't stay there. Um, so we have that same um, recommendation against mosquitoes to wear light colored mm-hmm. clothing, but that's for a different purpose. So ticks won't see that you are wearing lighter colored clothes or they won't be, they won't see you more if you wear dark. Mm -hmm. This is just for you to be able to see them on yourself um, and increase the contrast. Yeah. I guess they're not really seeing, they're just kind of waiting to to grab whatever runs past. Yeah. Some, some ticks don't have eyes. Um, uh, American dog ticks do, but they really don't see very clearly at all. Their eyes are on what, what we would, when we look at them, what we would consider their shoulders. Yeah. Um, and it just looks like little, um, they look like little bumps. They look like nothing. If you, if you didn't know it was an eye, you, you, you really wouldn't know. Uh, so yeah, they don't have good eyesight. Uh, this is really just for you to see them. Uh, you can wear repellent. So uh, any repellent that has DEET or a keratin are going to be very good at repelling ticks. And so what I would recommend is to uh, spray that on the lower part of your body. Mm -hmm. So, because that's where the ticks are going to come in contact with you in the first place. So if you don't like to wear repellent and, and you don't want that close to your face, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you are concerned about ticks, then just spraying the lower part of your body will really actually help in reducing uh, those ticks there. Um, and then, uh, like I said, when you, once you get home, check yourself, check your children, check your pets so that you don't bring ticks in that are not yet attached, but will attach to you, uh, when you're not really concerned about ticks anymore, because you're in your safe environment at home. Um, I've had that happen to me before where, um, you know, I come back from looking for ticks all day and I check and I check and I remove a whole bunch um, while I'm driving, usually it's when you're, when you're driving, they come out, I've had, you know, driving on the highway and I have a tick walking on the yeah. rim of my glasses. <laughs> um, but I get home and I don't notice anything. I take my clothes off. That's what I do. First thing when I get home, get naked, hit the shower. And then the next morning I wake up and I had a tick on my, on my tummy. Um, yeah. so I, huh, where did you come from? You weren't there when I was showering. Right. Yeah. But you know, I must have missed a tick that was um, on my clothes. And so you have to, you know, I did not do what I tell everybody to do, which is to stick your stuff in the dryer. Yeah. I didn't do that. Um, so you have to, you know, 
inspect everything so that you don't um, you don't bring them in. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned, you know, you, you maybe you don't like throw your clothes in the laundry or the dryer right away. You just leave it on the floor. Is there any concern of kind of ticks infesting your home? Ah, that's an interesting question. Um, because for the two species I was talking about, mm-hmm. no, um, they don't, they don't live indoors. Uh, first of all, our houses are much too dry anyway. Um, and so, you know, they could crawl around, but it's not like if you have a male and a female, they're going to colonize your house. Um, so for those two species, but there is one species of ticks that can survive very well in a house. Um, and it does happen sometimes uh, here in Manitoba. That's the brown dog tick. Okay. Um, it's the most common tick in the world, really. It's, it's everywhere. Um, it doesn't um, it doesn't survive outdoors here in, in Manitoba. Winter takes care of it. But um, what we see, uh, it's, it's the brown dog tick. So in the name there, they really <laughs> like dogs, right? Dogs are their mm-hmm. main um, their main host. And typically what we see in Manitoba is people will be more and more traveling with their dogs. Mm-hmm. And so during the winter holidays, we'll be going to Mexico, for example, and they'll mm-hmm. bring their pet And they won't think of tick treatment because in Manitoba, it's not tick season um, or they don't typically treat for ticks. And while in Mexico, the dog will come in contact with uh, brown dog ticks and they bite dogs, not people. They will bring back brown dog ticks on their dog without knowing and noticing. And the brown dog ticks will very well colonize a house. And you, most people won't notice until there, until there's, there's ticks crawling up the wall in Ooh. February or March, um, because they don't bother humans. And unless they pay attention to their dog, they won't notice even that there's ticks yeah. there until there's a lot. What a horrible vision. <laughs> what a horrible <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can you can treat for them. Um, and so, I mean, my first recommendation there would be obviously if you're traveling with your pet, always make sure that they are protected against ticks. Uh, and while you're away, uh, check for them, check for ticks all the time. You should check for parasites on your pets all the time anyway, make sure they're okay. Mm-hmm. They usually won't tell you they have a problem. Um, but when you're coming back from travel, also uh, check your pet, make sure everything is okay. Uh, and if, you know, unluckily you do bring some ticks in and you don't notice an infestation until it's very late, um, y- you know, you can, you can treat uh, mm-hmm. and you can get rid of them. Don't worry. Uh, I know, you know, when you're looking at headlines, you see some uh, sensationalized uh, posts about like, oh, the tick that can cause the allergies to red meat. And us in North America, we're so concerned about not being able to (laughs) to eat red meat. Um, And ticks that can cause paralysis. Are are these things that are actually happening in Manitoba on a substantial level? Or is it just kind of, you know, people traveling, picking it up, like uh, in terms of the brown dog tick? Um, We don't have, as far as I know, we've not had tick paralysis or the red meat allergy uh, from Manitoba, but those are things that that do and can happen. Uh, Tick paralysis can happen and does happen uh, mostly out west. So uh, sometimes, uh, well, there's been some cases in Alberta, but it's mostly BC. Um, and, And So I can talk about that a little bit just because at least there's some Canadian uh, content here. (laughs) Um, And so it's a a close relative to our uh, American dog tick. Um, Mm. It's the Rocky Mountain wood tick. Okay. So um, ticks in the same genus, they look very, very similar. And in certain areas of uh, interior BC, um, some of those ticks um, have a protein in their saliva that will cause paralysis. So as they are feeding, they're injecting this toxin and that will eventually slowly accumulate in the body and cause paralysis. Uh, The nice thing with these is that if you remove the ticks, then paralysis is reversed. 
Mm -hmm. There are other places in the world, like in Australia, where their ticks can also cause paralysis and it is not reversible. So that's, that's, it's the same principle. It's a toxin in the saliva, Mm -hmm. um, but over there it's not reversible and here it is. So um, it's not just anecdotal. It it does happen. It's rare in humans, uh, but it is a concern for cattle production in in BC, Mm -hmm. for example. Of course. Um, Red meat allergy. Now that's a really cool one. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a, actually an immune reaction. Uh, so to, uh, to uh, uh, sugar and it's associated with uh, lone star ticks. Mm-hmm. So lone star ticks also are not established in Canada at the moment, but you can find them. Um, I always say, if you're lucky, most people find that unlucky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess my, my interest is a yeah, little different, bit uh, different showing here. Different perspectives. Exactly. So um, I have a, uh, at the time, student who uh, found some uh, here in, in, in Beaudry Provincial Park uh, some years ago, uh, just as we were doing surveillance and looking for other ticks. So it's possible uh, a couple of years ago, there's quite a few that were found around the Brandon area. So you can find them. Uh, but they're not established that that we know of that that we can that we can find yeah. and prove, um, and so yeah, in certain areas, usually in the southern U.S., um, there's an association with getting a bite from those ticks and developing a red meat allergy. Um, I know three people who have developed that allergy. Um, okay. One person just quit eating red meat. Uh, actually, he quit eating meat at all. He just said, that's it. I'm done. I'm vegetarian. (laughs) Um, And the other two um, desensitized themselves to it and are now able to eat normally. Um, And so they both have a a science background. And so they said, well, I'm going to do just like when you go to the allergist and they they give you micro doses of what you're allergic to, to desensitize you. So they sort of micro dose themselves with red meat uh, over a period of about two years. And then now they're fine. Yeah. I mean, in terms of tick-borne diseases, uh, developing an allergy to red meat seems relatively tame. I mean, people would disagree (laughs) wholeheartedly. (laughs) What, I can't eat a burger anymore? It's like, yeah, well, Lyme disease is pretty uh, intense. So I guess coming back to that, you know, we talk a little bit about the ticks, how to get them, some of these more niche ticks that we can find. Uh, around the area, not necessarily here in Manitoba, but uh, you find a uh, black legged dog tick or a deer tick on you and you don't know how long it's been there and it's relatively engorged. Um, Is there a moment when should you be concerned? And, you know, you know, when we're talking about Lyme disease, when should we be seeking medical attention for that? So um, I'll let's just answer this. I'll walk you through a scenario. And then sort of go through, all right, this is what you do. So you're out hiking and you come back and you're exhausted and you say, I know this lady on the internet said that I needed to shower, but I'm exhausted. I'm just going to go to bed. I feel gross. I don't care. I fall asleep. You fall asleep. And the next morning you wake up and you kind of, you know, scratch here and there, you have your breakfast. Um, All this to say that it takes, you know, maybe a day and a half, two days before you actually get naked and, you know, look at yourself and then you find a tick. And of course this thing has been feeding for a little while. It's a little fat. So you're going to remove it um, as soon as you find it, then you need to identify it. You need to figure out what it is. Is it a black legged tick? If it's not a black legged tick, then you're not going to be concerned about Lyme disease. Um, You're still going to be checking that you don't have weird symptoms and that there's no local Mm -hmm. infection, but you're not going to be concerned about other pathogens. So your first step would be to seek a way to identify it. So there are different resources Uh, here in Manitoba. Now we're part of the surveillance program that the province is using is ETIC. So E-T-I-C-K dot C-A. So you would then snap a picture, upload that, and they will identify the tick for you. If they tell you it's Ixodes scapularis, a black-legged tick, 
then you need to keep in mind that you may have been exposed to mm -hmm. a variety of pathogens. So after you've removed your tick, um, before you took the picture, you cleaned out the bite site and you're going to start monitoring for any kind of symptoms mm -hmm. that you're not used to. We say flu-like symptoms. Um, that would be aches, fever, that kind of stuff um, for a period of 30 days. I always say when you remove a black legged tick from your body, um, write it on the calendar because you won't remember like three weeks from now, you may not remember exactly what day you got. I it. can't remember so, what I, I ate yesterday. <laughs> exactly. Right. So write it on the calendar and then for a period of uh, 30 days, monitor yourself, you know, body awareness, <laughs> figure out, is yeah. this, am I feeling normal? Um, with Lyme disease, we often hear, and I, this is for Lyme disease, but any tick-borne illness, right? Mm -hmm. But specifically for Lyme disease, there's a couple things to keep in mind. The tick needs um, at least, well, it's actually more like 36 hours okay. um, for the tick to be able to transmit the bacteria. So for simplicity purposes, if the tick has been attached for less than 24 hours, the chances of getting Lyme is really, really small. Mm -hmm. um, like, I'm, I, I, I'm as, as, as a scientist, I can't say impossible, um, but it's, it's very really unlikely, very unlikely, very unlikely. Um, and if we have time, we can go into why. Mm -hmm. um, but for for other pathogens like anaplasma and babesiosis and things like that, or babesia, um, transmission can happen more quickly. Uh, so that's why you want to remove the tick as quick as possible. For Lyme disease, sometimes we hear about this bullseye rash as one of the symptoms. Not everybody who's infected with uh, the bacteria that causes Lyme, not everybody gets the rash. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you do get the rash, uh, it's a specific rash. So a rash from a tick bite is normal. What is not normal is a rash that is more than five centimeters in diameters and that expands in time. So if you have a bigger, bigger rash around your bite site um, and you think maybe it's expanding, because trust me, when you look at this thing, you're going to feel that it's expanding. <laughs> <laughs> I usually say take uh, a pen, mm -hmm. like a marker or ballpoint pen, something like that, and trace around the edge of your rash. If the next day the red has expanded beyond your marker, then yes, it's expanding. Yeah. Right. That's one way to check. So it has to be more than five centimeters in diameter. So that's across, yeah. right. And um, expanding in time. If you have that, that is a diagnostic uh, symptom and you need treatment. Let's say um, your tick has been attached. You know, for a fact, it's been attached for um, at least 36 hours. At that point, if it's a black-legged tick, I would immediately go see um, your family physician um, mm -hmm. because you are at high risk. And in Manitoba, um, the recommendations to phys physicians have changed recently. And at that point, your physician should be able to give you um, antibiotics because you are at greater risk. Yeah. Um, let's say you removed it in time, and but after a couple of weeks, you're got stiff neck and maybe some fever and, you know, could be COVID, but you had a tick bite, go see your physician, explain specifically that you think you might, you may be at risk for tick-borne illness, explain uh, what you've, uh, that you've had your bite. If you still have the tick, um, then you can show it to show that it was a black-legged tick. Um, and then your physician can decide, uh, what they're, what they're going to do. But if you have within 30 days of, uh, a black legged tick bite, any kind of, uh, flu like symptoms, mm -hmm. then, then definitely I'd say, uh, go see your family physician. Yeah. And so these sort of similar, uh, awarenesses and practices would apply to a, a pet as well. Yes. Yeah, so for a pet, it's a little bit more difficult because your pet won't say that they have, you know, aches and pains, and very often pets will hide um, things like that. Um, the it'll be a lot more difficult to see a rash on a pet 
Um, and so that's a little bit more uh, complicated. And so if you are in an area where there is, um, there's a lot of black-legged ticks and there's a higher risk of um, tick-borne illnesses, this is something I would discuss with your vet. But at the very least, I would say as soon as the snow melts, probably start a tick treatment to reduce mm -hmm. the chances that ticks will um, attach and feed for long enough uh, on your, on your pet um, and perhaps consider uh, one of the Lyme vaccines that are available for dogs. Um, I wouldn't say, I would not recommend to just straight out vaccinate your dog. Um, this is something that needs to be discussed with your vet. Uh, mm -hmm. There are risks that come with uh, vaccination for certain breeds. Um, and so unless there's high risk, uh, this is, this is a discussion you need with, with your vet, but at the very least, I would say tick protection will help with your pets. Tick protection. And then, yeah, just have a conversation with your vet. If yeah. that's something yeah. you're worried about, specifically, if you're going on hikes in the bush <laughs> with your, mm -hmm. your dog. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, yeah, that, that covers a lot. I, I learned a, a <laughs> lot here. Uh, how about we just, um, uh, I'll, I'll give you a moment to talk a little bit about uh, the research and what you're doing at, at the university in terms of, you know, just learning uh, about ticks and, and entomology and where can people go to find out more information or to support, you know, uh, tick research as it's in incredibly important. <laughs> oh, well, that's a, it's a great, uh, great opportunity. First thing I'll mention is, especially if you're in, in Manitoba, if you want more resources on how to protect yourself um, against uh, tick bites, what to do maybe uh, to make your backyard less tick friendly, um, or maybe some reminders on how to check for ticks, the um, government of Manitoba, the Manitoba Health website has a, um, a tick specific area and there are resources there for the public. And there's uh, uh, a little uh, PDF file about how to uh, tick proof your yard, for example. Mm -hmm. um, they also have a little uh, postcard that you can print uh, that, get, that helps you get through um, all those steps for a tick check, for example. Um, so those resources are there. Um, and there's a lot of information about where you find the ticks and where they have been found in Manitoba. So mm -hmm. I would recommend that people go there. Um, as far as my research, uh, this year I've started a project. I work the, mostly work with uh, American dog ticks uh, mm -hmm. now, and I'm interested in their ability to transmit a certain bovine disease called uh, anaplasmosis as well, but it's bovine anaplasmosis. So not the same one that's transmitted by black legged ticks. It's transmitted by um, American dog ticks to cattle, not to humans. Um, and so I have uh, a whole team this summer and we go out and we, we scratch cattle for ticks. And so we have <laughs> cattle that are uh, in, in squeeze shoots and we go there and then we, we actually massage them and remove ticks from them and then we get those tested. And so we're trying to figure out um, the risk um, for, for um you know, within pastures and, and all of that. And so it, that's, that's, that's one thing I do. And I'm also uh, part of the Canadian Lyme disease research network. And so I do the surveillance for the network uh, in the province of Manitoba. So for that, I'm looking for black legged tick nymphs. So those super mm -hmm. tiny those ones, super small poppy size uh, ones. Yeah. So that keeps us uh, busy in June. And um, yeah, so it's all, Right now, it's all ticky goodness, but I've also worked with biting flies, and I hope to get back there um, in the future. <laughs> if people are interested in uh, learning more about entomology in general, if you're a university student, definitely check out uh, the Department of Entomology um, website and check out our courses. We have all kinds of entry-level stuff. Um, and maybe you'll just be just like me and have your life completely changed by an entomology course. If you have any stories you'd like us to share or communities we should highlight, leave a comment down below and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date with everything you multicultural is doing. I'm Ryan Funk. This was You Talk, and have yourself a good one.